I mean, if you picture 500 miles of amazing rivers, and for every stretch of river, there's a different fish to be caught. In the heart of the Northern Rockies lies a hidden passage, a winding back road through such extraordinary beauty and solitude, it leaves indelible marks on the spirits of those who visit. I truly think it's one of the most magical places that I have ever been. Along the way, it passes through some of America's most spectacular scenery. Jagged peaks, enchanting deserts, shimmering waters and pristine forests. But this is more than a scenic byway. This journey threads a string of jewels, many of the West's most coveted waters. We just call it the Rocky Mountain Fly Highway just because there's so many places to fly fish. From Yellowstone National Park in Wyoming, through Montana, across Idaho, all the way to the Oregon border. One 500-mile stretch of U.S. Highway 20 connects more than a dozen almost mythical waters. Some are legendary. You have Silver Creek, Yellowstone, Madison River. Others hold secret treasures that cast away all doubt. Wow. This is the mecca of fly fishing. Oh, big fish! When you get a fish on here, oh. it's like nothing you've ever experienced before. That a girl! <laughs> For me, watching my daughter catch fish, it, there's nothing better. The black top leads to streams in volcanic Yellowstone that look like they're on fire. Rivers clear as glass. Rivers picturesque as paintings. Under skies so blue, it almost hurts to look at them. And as we follow this bewitching highway through this Rocky Mountain playground, we just might catch a few trout along the way, the kind of trophy trout anglers dream about. Welcome to the Rocky Mountain Fly Highway, a region that draws anglers from all over the world in a setting that restores the soul. Fishing or sightseeing in Yellowstone National Park is akin to visiting another planet. In few other places on Earth is it possible to fish for a rare species of native trout in a river that boils and bubbles. Here the Yellowstone and Firehole Rivers flow through eerie landscapes shaped by cataclysmic eruptions. Much of Yellowstone Park lies above the largest supervolcano in North America. If you could spend an afternoon drifting with the Yellowstone River's currents, you'd see bubbling riffles, steam vents, geysers, and other geological wonders. You'd encounter bear, bison, and elk. You'd see one of America's iconic waterfalls. A river 300 feet wide in places. And the same river, narrowed and meandering through meadows, rolling past forested slopes, or forming eerily beautiful pools. And if you cast a fly into one of these unique waters, you just might catch a Yellowstone cutthroat trout, a species found almost exclusively in the Yellowstone River Sadly, these prize game fish are threatened. The custom here, as on most blue ribbon trout streams, catch it, take a photo, and gently release it to live and reproduce. I think trout live in such a great environment and great beautiful clear rivers that that's the part of the appeal for coming out here. Hooked by a magazine article on trout fishing in the West, Bob Jacklin left his native New Jersey the day he got out of the Army. 
took one look at Yellowstone National Park and never looked back. It was the adventure of being in Montana and Yellowstone Park. For me, it was the fishing. This is the best fishing in the lower 48 states. So I wanted to be here. And once I got a taste and saw the Grand Tetons for the first time and saw Yellowstone, I couldn't resist. I wanted to spend my life here, and I did. A master guide and fly tire, Jacqueline has led hundreds of anglers to the catches of their lifetimes. Watching him cast a fly and land a trout is like watching Monet with brushes and paints. I'm always learning. If I really thought I knew it all, it'd be pretty boring. All modesty aside, it's hard to say which is a greater work of art, Jacqueline with a fly rod or his backdrop this morning, the Firehole River with its steamy beauty. A tributary of the Madison River, the Firehole flows through several of Yellowstone's geyser basins. Named for the steam that makes it look as if it's on fire, the river is renowned for its dry fly fishing. Its trout aren't large, but they're hungry and plentiful. And when Jacqueline works his magic, it isn't long until they're in the net. This is Mecca. This is the place for trout fishing. It's also our national park. This is what we can show people that come from Italy and Japan and Germany. This is what we have to show in our country. This is our park. It's great. Jacqueline has no regrets about his decision to head west as a young man bewitched by trout streams. His has been the life of a consummate fly fisherman. And when it's run its course, his final wish is to go with his waiters on. Thank you, Lord, I got my fish. You can take me now with you. Montana's Madison River is legendary in fly fishing circles. Perhaps the most famous of all the rivers in Montana, the Madison begins at the confluence of the Firehole and Gibbon Rivers in the Yellowstone National Park. It flows west and the north for more than 140 miles through broad valleys and snow-capped peaks before it joins the Missouri River. Often ranked as the top wild trout fishery in the U.S., the Madison's plentiful brown, rainbow, and cutthroat trout draw anglers from across the world. In spring and fall, the Madison's cold, clear waters are alive with trout, dancing to their own breakfast ballet, a feast upon the bounty of the hatch. In 1805, famed explorer Meriwether Lewis named the river for then Secretary of State James Madison. But anglers who love the Madison will more likely recall the stunning Montana vistas, punctuated by the mingling fragrances of sage and pine. Tight lines on the Madison make fishermen's hearts beat quicker during its abundant hatches. For those who live to fly fish, this is Nirvana. Five miles west of Yellowstone National Park lies Hebgen Lake. Hebgen is a reservoir formed by the Madison River and the Hebgen Dam. It's widely considered the best stillwater fishing lake in Montana. Every fall, Hebgen's waters almost boil with activity. The bubbles and rings are caused by trout engaged in a feeding frenzy. Locals call it the gulping season, when the fish surface to gorge themselves on mayflies, fattening up for the cold months of winter that lie ahead. Gulper are simply big brown trout and rainbow trout, which uh, even when they attain large size of 20 inches or more, will cruise and eat dry flies from the surface. And so you have a world-class dry fly fishing opportunity, which can be technical sometimes, but uh, it's excellent sight fishing 
and a really exciting opportunity to cast small drives for large fish. Habgen has long been a destination for fishermen and families. In 1943, Lewis M. Lewis bought a cabin on Hebgen, sight unseen, from a man on a train. Fish were so plentiful then that he and others caught six at a time on lines with multiple hooks. His granddaughter, Wendy Eisenhardt, spent idyllic summers of her youth there. By the time I was 10 years old, I could tell the difference between a rainbow trout, a brown trout, a cutthroat, and they're native here. Today she continues the tradition with her grandchildren. I think one of the reasons I fish, or fishermen fish, is just you get to go to such a great area to do it. The serenity and just having something to do and be out in this beautiful country. With scenes like these, it's not hard to see why. Few places in the world feature the quality and quantity of fly fishing found along the Rocky Mountain Fly Highway. From Yellowstone Park to the Oregon border, the Fly Highway threads many of the West's most prized blue ribbon waters. A blue ribbon designation is the mark of extremely high water quality and exceptional recreational fishing. As the Fly Highway exits Montana, it climbs west over Targhee Pass, here where it enters Idaho. The Rocky Mountains rise up to split the waters of the continent. All waters east of this continental divide flow toward the Mississippi. All rivers west of it flow out to the Pacific Ocean. All rivers should be lucky enough to have big springs as their birthplace. The natural freshwater springs produce more than 100 million gallons a day of water, so cold and clear it seems to glow in shimmering emeralds and aquamarines. It's the perfect habitat for trout, who return to these waters every year to spawn. The springs are the source of the Henry's Fork of the Snake River, one of the West's preeminent trout fishing streams. Tempting as they may look, leave your fly rod in the car. The rainbows here may be enormous, but they're also protected. Lake in eastern Idaho not only feeds the renowned Henry's Fork River, it's one of the West's finest high mountain fishing lakes, legitimately famous for its trophy-sized hybrid trout. A cross between a cutthroat and a rainbow trout, the Henry's Lake hybrid grows faster to a larger size, lives longer, and fights harder than any other fish in the lake. There's people come here from all over the world to try to catch these trophy-sized hybrids. And the brook trout, the Idaho State record brook trout is out of this lake at just over seven pounds. And that's, that's huge. The world record, I think, is around 11. The lake is just jammed full of food and it produces big fish. We want to anchor right towards those pelicans. Ed Given first saw Henry's Lake during a two-day fishing trip in 1972. Now he lives here. Only got that in the background. Oh, didn't that was good timing. Forgiven. Come on, fish, get away from the anchor. Fly fishing is a family affair. His sons, daughters, and grandchildren cherish fly fishing summers at the lake, that for many of them has become a second home. Today, Ed and his grandson Dylan reel in a double. 
it seems like that's always what we try to go for. I know when like my grandpa hooks a fish, I always try a little bit harder to get a fish. Yeah, it just adds a little more drama to it. You got a fish going under his line, this one's over here, and you know, it creates a little more havoc, but uh, it's all fun. Isn't that a pretty fish? Uh, oh yeah, yours is nice. Yeah. Dylan likens fly fishing to religion. It soothes both mind and spirit. We have a great quote, and I love it. It's, I'd rather go fly fishing and think about God than go to church and think about fly fishing. And that's one that I've always just really loved. The pair has caught thousands of fish on Henry's Lake over the years, but rarely keeps a catch, preferring to let them go to catch again another day. Idaho's Harriman State Park is an 11,000 acre wildlife refuge in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. It used to be a playground for millionaires. Railroad Ranch was the private retreat of the Harriman Railroad Barons and the Guggenheim families. In 1977, the Harrimans deeded it to Idaho free of charge to be used as a state park. Wildlife from songbirds to raptors, from moose and bear, to two-thirds of the lower 48's wintering trumpeter swan population. Call this area home. And of course, a river runs through it. The Henry's Fork and its prolific trout, once pursued exclusively by tycoons and their guests, now belong to all of us. Just downriver from Harriman Park, Mesa Falls is one of the West's treasures. Here, the Henry's Fork of the Snake River plunges more than 100 feet over a basalt cliff to create one of the West's most beautiful waterfalls. Wallace Stegner, the late dean of Western writers, described it as thundering foam and green glass, purity absolute. Few things are truly awe-inspiring. Mesa Falls is one of them. Whether you fish it or not, it's well worth a stop. The Fork of the Snake is revered for its dry fly fishing as well as its scenic beauty. It flows through evergreen and cottonwood forests, it cuts through steep canyons, and winds past open plains. No one knows the Henry's Fork better than Doug Gibson, the head guide at Three Rivers Ranch. He's fished the Henry's Fork for half a century and he's been an Orvis-endorsed guide on this river and its tributaries for more than four decades. It's probably the best place to come for dry fly action because of the hatches on the Henry's Fork. The insect population in the stream is unreal. The flies Gibson ties in a rustic cabin literally millions through the years. works of art. I would say that if you would talk to anybody in eastern Idaho that is a guide, they would know the name Doug Gibson. They would have the utmost respect for him, and if they ever needed any help whatsoever, he would be there for them. Outfitter Lonnie Allen has worked side by side with Gibson for more than 40 years. She understands the allure of a sport bordering on addiction. It can last a lifetime. You just become in that element. 
Come on, fish. As you are casting and mending and looking at every rock and nook and cranny to find a trout, and as you watch that fly float down and you're waiting, anticipating for that moment when that trout will come out and grab that fly. There. It's overwhelming spectacular. I can't even describe it. Wow. <laughs> Keep it tight, honey. Everybody should try it. Got it. Oh, good. <laughs> nice fish. Woohoo! As for Gibson, he's fished virtually all of the West Great Rivers, but the Henry's Fork is his favorite. The Henry's Fork is a place where you can always go somewhere on it and catch fish. And though he's a fly fisherman to the core, he thinks the river is too beautiful not to share. The Henry's Fork is such a gorgeous place that everybody deserves a shot at it. The Rocky Mountain Fly Highway weaves a little known path connecting more than a dozen of America's premier fly waters. It's just one thing, the fishing, and that they're actually really amazing rivers. But it's also, they're surrounded by some of the most beautiful scenery in the world. Around every bend unfolds another iconic landscape. As Highway 20 moves south down the state of Idaho, it passes the undisputed guardians of this valley, the Grand Tetons. The Teton Mountains rise nearly 14,000 feet above a scene abundant with wildlife and alpine terrain. The mountains themselves lie in Wyoming, but the view from Highway 20 on the Idaho side includes a rich agricultural patchwork the Teton Valley, ribbon with rivers of opportunity. For those who prefer a solitary experience with no crowds or competition for fishing holes, the Fall River lies in wait. The Fall River crosses below Highway 20, near the town of Ashton. Work your way up this remote river and you will arrive at its headwaters in the southwest sliver of Yellowstone National Park, called the Cascade Corner, for a good reason. It's hard to imagine a more beautiful backdrop for fly fishing than Cape Falls. Here, the Fall River spans a 250-foot-wide natural waterfall. The fish may be small, but the scenery is grand. Fishing for rainbow and cutthroat trout in crystal clear water, with a mist rising around you, and cave falls crashing in the background is an experience never forgotten. Many anglers say their sport is as much about being one with the surroundings as it is landing fish. There's no question that spending time on rivers, like the Teton, is good for the soul. Its spring-fed waters gently flow through the lush Teton Valley, providing an ideal environment for pursuing its rainbow, cutthroat, hybrid, or brook trail. Whether from a drift boat, the banks, or for those who like their fishing up close and personal, standing chest deep in waders. The fish are fat and plentiful. And even if the fish aren't biting, the music of songbirds, an unexpected glimpse of wildflowers or a soaring raptor, and the ever-changing views of the majestic Tetons 
will make the world of deadlines and gridlock fade away. The South Fork of the Snake River has a legitimate claim to being one of the best fly fishing rivers in the West or anywhere. Its prolific stonefly population helps make it one of the most productive trout streams on the continent. Over 5,000 fish per mile. Oh, there we go. And Yellowstone cutthroat, its signature fish, are known and prized by anglers everywhere. Yellowstone Cuddy. That's a native of South Fork. Chad Allen grew up fishing the South Fork. His great-great-grandmother pioneered the area that is now Three Rivers Ranch, one of the nation's premier fly fishing resorts. Now a guide, Chad says there's no place he'd rather be than the South Fork of the Snake. From a drift boat, you can experience 30, 40 miles all in one day. You get to fish the grassy banks, you get to fish the gravel bars. It's breathtaking, and I could come and just float the river, and I'd be happy. I don't even have to take a rod. And there's a lot more to the South Fork than fishing. Thank you. Those lucky enough to float the canyon are likely to see an abundance of wildlife, and soaring evidence of one of America's largest bald eagle populations sailing on invisible currents. You have mountains and forests and vast canyon, and with the animals that are around, the wildlife, it's just unique for not only fly fishermen, but, but just anyone that wants to come and see a beautiful river. The South Fork Canyon is a hidden paradise. Long stretches flow through a roadless wilderness, accessible only by boat. It's just you and a lovely, peaceful canyon. Forested hills, striking rock formations, sparkling waters, and of course, fish. As the fly highway moves west across southern Idaho, Lush, forested banks give way to seemingly desolate desert. But look a little closer and you'll find an oasis. Idaho's Big Lost River is aptly named. The river literally disappears, descending underground to feed the Snake River aquifer. But prior to its vanishing act, the Big Lost is a trout stream. Autumn may be the best time to fish the Lost River Valley. Those who do will find rainbow, cutthroat, and brook trout in the clear, cold waters of a stream that gets little fishing pressure. There aren't a lot of people in this rugged country. You're more likely to see a mountain goat, moose, antelope, or elk than a traffic sign or a cell tower. And if you get your fill of trout in solitude, you're less than an hour from cosmopolitan Sun Valley. Just 10 miles past the Big Lost River, Highway 20 passes through craters of the Moon National Monument. It's both a pleasant stop and a dramatic change of scenery. Craters of the Moon is unique. There's no place like it, this side of, well, the moon. Apollo astronauts trained here for their lunar missions. It's 400 square miles of lava flows and cinder cones with their own otherworldly beauty. And if your timing is right in the spring, you'll see the seemingly impossible. Thousands of delicate wildflowers growing right out of the rock. Idaho's world-renowned Silver Creek gets its name from the way the day's last light makes it gleam like a newly minted coin. The meandering spring-fed stream winds through Idaho's high desert, not far from the star-studded town of Sun Valley. 
Author Ernest Hemingway fell in love with Silver Creek in 1939. He was there to hunt ducks, but in a letter to his son Jack, said he'd never seen so many big trout rising and promised to take the youngster fishing there. He kept that promise, and the world-class fly fishing eventually lured Jack Hemingway to move to Idaho. And it was Jack who brought the Nature Conservancy to his beloved stream to protect and preserve more than 800 acres along these banks. Anglers consider Silver Creek one of the world's most challenging streams. You can have ideal conditions, the right fly, the perfect cast, and still go home frustrated. It's such a, a paradoxical place. You know, you've got desert and wetlands. It's, a, it's an oasis. And you know, the paradox continues with the fish. There's tons of food, and the fish are feeding, yet they're hard to catch. You know, they're eating right in front of you, and you can't get them. And I think it's that, that uh, kind of juxtaposition, that, that paradox that, that makes this river really appealing. It's serene and challenging and, and, and peaceful and beautiful and, and frustrating. And it's, it's everything you want in a river. Brett Bishop has been fishing Silver Creek since he was a boy. He's a high school literature teacher who spends his summers as a fly fishing guy. He has a master's degree, but the trout at Silver Creek have PhDs. There's an incredible amount of food in this river. And the fish know what their food looks like. And they can see it so well because the water's crystal clear and slow. Watching Bishop practice his skills is like watching a ballet. Silver Creek's brown drake hatch is a marvel, a virtual snowstorm of swirling insects. People come from all over the world to experience this hatch, because it really is you know, the eighth wonder of the world. And the fish just go out of their minds for this hatch. It's one of those things that uh, should be on everybody's bucket list. It's amazing. Of all the rivers Brett has fished around the world, he keeps coming back to his favorite, his home water on Silver Creek. We've got the bugs, we've got the fish, we've got the scenery. You know, not many streams have that type of complete package that Silver Creek has. Uh, we're lucky to have such an amazing fishery like this. In a eulogy for a friend, Hemingway wrote that best of all, he loved the fall. The leaves yellow on the cottonwoods, leaves floating on the trout streams. His inspiration may have been the Big Wood River, which got its name from the cottonwoods that line its banks. The Big Wood flows through some of the most scenic parts of Idaho. Its source is high in the Sawtooth Range. It winds its way past the Pioneer, Boulder, and Smoky Mountains, and through Ketchum and Sun Valley. Fly fishers prize its hard-fighting native trout, its wildlife, and its tranquil beauty. There are more famous fly fishing rivers, but the Big Wood and its smaller cousin, the Little Wood, have inspired artists as well as anglers for generations. It could take months or years to fish all the waters that line the Rocky Mountain Fly Highway, especially if you stop and smell the flowers along the way. The Fly Highway leads to some of the West's scenic gems, like Southern Idaho's Camas Prairie and Centennial Marsh. The wetland is bone dry by late July, but go in spring or early summer and you'll see millions of camas blossoms. You'll see the yellow-headed blackbirds, sandhill cranes, and other marsh birds. And if you get there early enough, a prairie sunrise, 
There are worse ways to start the day. The South Fork of the Boise River is just over an hour's drive from Idaho's largest city, but a world apart. You can leave the office and 90 minutes later be in a canyon where the outside world hardly seems to exist. Quiet beauty within its towering lava rock walls is a balm for the spirit. Anglers are allowed to take two trout over 20 inches on the South Fork, but almost never do. Most release every fish they catch. The canyon inspires reverence for nature. Human acts that diminish it seem sinful. Dave and Kelsey Parker think of it as a family place. The Parkers have been on more camping trips here than they can count. You know, the, the South Fork of the Boise River offers trophy rainbow trout. Yeah, it's so big you won't fit in the net. It offers great camping, great fishing. I truly think it's one of the most magical places that I have ever been. This is by far my favorite river. Kelsey learned to fly fish here when she was a toddler. At 14, she can cast, read water, oh. and land the South Fork's you got him. big rainbows. You got him, just keep him tight, keep him tight. As well or better oh. than most grown-ups. Oh man, he's so nice. When you get a fish on here, it's like nothing you've ever experienced before. Oh, big fish. They're so strong here, and it's just so exciting to have that fight with that rainbow trout in the South Fork. Woo! Yeah. Woo! That a girl! <laughs> Even if you don't land them, it's just super fun. But if you get them in the net, you get great pictures and good memories, too. It's pretty fun. I loved it. <laughs> Kelsey and her dad agree that she's learned a lot more on the river than how to fish. There was a day that we were fishing about three years ago on this river, and it was a windy day. She never touched a fish all day long. We were getting close to the end, and Kelsey turned around on the tip of the raft, and she looked at me, and she goes, Dad, look at that canyon. And at that point, I just knew that she had it figured out. And the South Fork of the Boise has taught her that, and it's enabled me as a, as a vehicle to uh, have a good time. As Kelsey negotiates her teenage years, a time when some fathers and daughters barely speak. They don't worry about not communicating. They just go fishing. You know, I think you get one chance to raise your kids. And you get one chance at each stage of their life. And for our family, the river has been an important part of each one of those stages. Dave Parker loves the art of fly fishing. But what he loves more is passing it on to his daughter. For me, watching my daughter catch fish, it, there's nothing better. Good job. <laughs> I think there's always something new to learn about fly fishing, and it's always an interesting adventure that never ends, and it's nonstop, and it's amazing. Many cities have rivers running through them, but few claim urban fisheries as lovely as the city of Boise's. The river passes through a metropolitan area, offering residents, young and old, the opportunity to learn the art of fly fishing, just minutes from home. The Idaho Department of Fish and Game regularly stocks the river with rainbow trout and occasionally steelhead. Critics maintain that pressure to balance needs of the fishery with irrigation demands for agriculture make fewer and smaller fish. But on a given day, the fishing can be excellent. A record 20 pound brown trout was taken in the heart of the city, just a cast away from Boise's busy downtown.
As the Rocky Mountain Fly Highway crosses into eastern Oregon, it enters a sea of sagebrush, an iconic landscape of the American West. Here in the heart of the Oahe Desert lies the Oahe River. The Oahe is a tale of two rivers, its canyon section. The so-called Grand Canyon of Oregon is awe-inspiring. The canyon walls rise over a thousand feet with towering mosaics of basalt, rhyolite, and ash. But further downstream below Oahe Reservoir, the river transforms into the perfect habitat for trout. It's here where the Oahe has earned a reputation for its big browns. <laughs> Running. That's a lot of fish. But Oahe River is full of huge brown trout. They average between 17 to 20 inch, but it's not unusual to get them in the 24, 25, in, even 26 in, uh, inch range, which I have been so lucky to get before. Eileen Lane's introduction to fly fishing was tying flies for her husband. When she moved from Los Angeles to Idaho in 2012, she struck out on the fly highway to try some of those flies herself. She's been at it ever since. The wahi and its big brown trout are part of the reason why. The wahi is not an easy river to fish, and the fish are powerful. The first time I ever fished the Oahe, my friend helped me out and I actually hooked onto this brown. And that was the first time I ever hooked onto a brown here. I have never felt a force. I, I thought I was reeling in an elephant, is what it felt like. So goes the tale of fishing the Oahe. Because of those big browns, the river has become legendary in fly fishing circles. Yet Eileen says her attraction is about more than catching big fish. I think I'm always in awe. You know, I'll look up in the sky, and even just the, the cloud formations or how the light would reflect on the canyons or in the water. So every time I come here, it's like something new that I, I notice. Eileen also enjoys the camaraderie of fishing with other women. She and friends like Carol Lee are making inroads in a sport once reserved almost exclusively for men. I do find that as a senior lady with white hair that I get a lot of assistance from young men. <laughs> and I think that's very, very funny. <laughs> Gender aside, standing streamside in the Oahe's nine million acre expanse of uninterrupted desert can make you feel small, but most importantly, it makes you feel the whole sense of being out here is to just enjoy your surroundings. It's always about the surroundings here and about searching for that brown trout. The Rocky Mountain Fly Highway is just a small piece of U.S. Highway 20. But this 500-mile journey offers ever-changing wonders to explore and enjoy. Even if you don't fish, you could spend months soaking in the scenery of these western landscapes. Our trip ends at the Wahi River, the last of the Blue Ribbon trout streams along our way. But the adventure could carry on for a lifetime. You could spend many years exploring this passage and still never fish every riffle and hole. And even if the fish aren't biting, you'll find a tonic for the soul and the beauty and tranquility of these special places. Here's hoping these timeless landscapes remain unchanged, and these waters protected and cherished for all of us and forever. <laughs> <laughs>